Right, welcome to the 26th meeting of the 2018 um, Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Um, we have no apologies today. Before we move on to the first item in the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off their mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. So the first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether it's going to take items four, five and six in private. Are we agreed to do that? Agreed. Yes. Right. Second item on the agenda this morning is to take evidence on the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016, registers of persons holding a controlled interest in land. Scotland Regulations 2021 and draft. We have been joined by Megan McInnes from Global Witness, Dr Callum McLeod from Community Land Scotland, Jason Rust from Scottish Land in the States, John Sinclair from the Law Society of Scotland and Anne Stewart from the Scottish Property Federation. So welcome to all our guests. Um, we'll move straight on to our questions. Um, I, I'll, I'll open. Um, in looking at the submissions from you all, and most if not all of your organisations um, have made comment on the issue of whether it's right to have separate registers um, for registration and controlling interests. Um, and I guess this is a good opening question for, for everyone in the panel just to, to, to start the conversation off on this. Would the consolidation of the land registration data to include controlling interests be more effective than the creation of a separate register? I wonder if I can um, maybe take you from, from left, my, my left to right on that and get your, your views. Uh, thank you, convener. Thanks for the opportunity to come along to address the committee. Um, at Scottish Land and the States, our starting point during the um, early consultation was that we felt that to have another separate register was perhaps um, too much and we should be looking to consolidate and perhaps including this type of information within the land um, register system because obviously we've got the land register, we've got the season record, we've now got new registers coming on board in terms of abandoned and neglected land and sustainable development as well as the crofting registers and what have you and there was certainly a concern from a Scottish land and a state's perspective as to the potential burden that would place on the keeper. However, um, I think in discussions with Scottish um, government, I think the approach which um, I think really was being pursued was the idea of having a, se a separate register. And I think we have effectively come, you know, come around to the fact that that's the direction of travel. And um, I think our key concern now is just ensuring that what's there is workable in, in, in practice and um, is as Clear, as clear and transparent as as possible. Okay, Dr. McLeod. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and, and, and thank you to the committee for the, the invitation to come and give evidence in, in relation to this really important issue in, in Scotland's ongoing land reform journey, I suppose. Um, I, I think Committee Land Scotland's position initially would be that it would have been in an ideal world. Uh, useful to have all the information in a single uh, consolidated, uh, integrated register. Clearly that's not the position we're in now because there are, as we know, several other registers that um, separately hold information with regard to various aspects of, of, of land ownership and other aspects of tenure and so on. Uh, that being the case, I think Community Land Scotland would suggest that the, the key challenge then is to make sure, and we said this in our uh, submission in, in evidence, is to make sure that uh, the register that, that will be introduced as a result of the regulations is as cohesive and as integrated and as accessible as possible in relation to um, the information that's, that's put in it, but crucially as well in relation to the users of the register too. So um, clearly we're going to come on to, I'm sure, a variety of issues in terms of the enforcement and implementation of that register, but these are the critical elements. We are pleased, because we said it in our, our evidence, to see that um, the use of a register is going to be free, uh, as we understand it. That's, that's a helpful development. But yeah, we, uh, we think that the, the key challenges are, are, are about how this is going to be implemented and, and the challenges associated with that. Thank you. Megan McInnes. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much for giving the, having the chance to um, speak today and give evidence. Before I start, I just would like to say, convener, that I'm here representing Global Witness only. I'm not here in my capacity as a land commission, so nothing I say is. Uh, is, is should be taken as a representative of the position of the Land Commission or the Scottish Government. So I just wanted to have that on the record before we start. Um, 
I mean, I, I think I'm going to say something which very much reflects actually what the two speakers have just said, in, in which is that initially Global Witness had also taken the position that the best approach for a register of, of who ultimately owns land in Scotland would be best placed as part of Scotland's existing land register. Um, we saw, we, I agree, we, we, we agreed with the range of different reasons why we thought that there was the best way in which it would be easy to access it, that information. But again, we are, we are on, on a different path in terms of how these registers now operate. And again, our, our concerns now in terms of the draft regulations which have been produced are that they are user-friendly, they are easily accessible for the general public. Their purpose, the purpose of this register is, to, is, is, a, is a public interest purpose in, in terms of making access to this information more easily accessible. And uh, we hope that by combining access to all of these different registers through the gateway of the Scotless system, that that will overcome some of the, the problems which we currently see in terms of thinking about how these registers will, will be integrated. So um, that's, that's our position on this. It's, um, it's not what we had originally, initially recommended at the start of the process when this was a proposal in the uh, land reform bill, but we think that using the Scotless as a gateway, as a portal to access this information is a good solution to the route that's been chosen. Thank you. Thank you. John Sinclair. <clears throat> Thank you. The Law Society's view is that there should be separate registers. Um, the land register is a register of ownership of land. The register of, of controlling interest is um, focusing on, on different issues. That We thought that if you were to bring the ROCI into the land register, it would cause confusion and disrupt the land registration process. Um, I would tend to agree that the accessibility is uh, the, the important, uh, or is an important part of it. Um, and also, finally, the information will be fragmented anyway between separate registers. And so it's not just the land register and the ROCI. You have um, persons of significant control, and then you will eventually have a register of overseas entities. And so- To explain, you said disrupt the registration process. Could you give us some more detail on what you mean by that? To unpack that, the concern was that the more information that was put into the land register that was not relating to ownership, uh, it would cause confusion, that there would be concerns about whether or not you needed the third party's consents to do, um, any, or to do any transactions on the property. And so it would, it would, it would um, invite people to get, um, basically uh, bring in issues that were not core to transferring land. Mm. Sorry. Yes, um, sure, sure. Um, I wonder if the register as it currently exists has already crossed that line. Um, I, just for the sake of argument, um, things like uh, registration of heritable right of access um, to a bit of land will be in the register, but is of course not associated with ownership. And similarly, uh, the granting uh, of, of uh, a, a real burden that relates to a heritable right of access on the part of another uh, person would be the same. So isn't the principle that, uh, there are, there, that there is information about other people that does not relate very directly to transactions uh, on land already in the existing register? Um. Yes, the register goes beyond ownership and deals with other real rights in land, real burdens, servitudes, and um, securities. I think when the 2012 Act land register was brought in, there was a debate about whether or not the status of, uh, for example, matrimonial homes um, were to be brought in. And I think the policy decision at that stage was made that the desire was to keep the land register real in the sense of real rights. Hence, servitudes, yes, burdens, yes, securities, yes, ownership, yes, but not things like um, uh, matter of yeah, consent or non entitled spouses. Um, there is, with things like uh, public rights away, there is a uh, there is a range of information that, is, that can be put into a land certificate that is not real in the same absolute sense as, as ownership or real burdens or servitudes, but which still will bind successors. Um, I think that the issue with um, controlling interest will be that they aren't 
they don't tend to relate to real rights. The issues of uh, influence and control are more nebulous. Um, and so, for example, there might there might be a concern that if someone was was listed as being as having um, influence or control, that their consent would be required. There's no um, hard legal analysis for why that would absolutely be required. It's simply that it's the sort of information that will invite people to ask more questions than are absolutely necessary. And that doesn't, in, sorry, that sounds like we're trying to hide information. It's more about keeping the transfer of land um, simple and objective. Sure. Thank you, and um, thank you uh, as well um, for uh, this opportunity um, to uh, give evidence on behalf of the Scottish Property Federation and its members. I think there are a variety of different views um, <clears throat> amongst the, the, the membership. Um, principally, uh, we think that um, uh, pushing on with the completion of the, the, the land register is going to um, be a, a significant contribution towards transparency of ownership, although I appreciate that um, we've got a slightly uh, different issue with the, um, uh, the controlled interest, controlling interest. Um, certainly, our clear view is that whatever the process um, is, whether it's a single register or, or, or a separate register, it should be simple, it should be straightforward, it shouldn't um, um, you know, be a hurdle or an obstacle to um, uh, inward investment into to, to Scottish land and, and property. Um, I personally think that there's a lot of information that the registers must have, their statistical information and so on, which were their resource available would allow them to actually establish quite a bit of the information or to interrogate um, owners of land um, based on what uh, information is already in uh, the land register. Harder to interrogate the Sazian register, of course, um, uh, but, but I think that's impractical from, from a, a resource um, perspective. Um, there is um, an appeal um, in terms of simplicity to have an extra box that you can take on an application form or, or, or something of that sort that would, that would populate this information. But I think that has to be tempered by um, the concern over um, access to that information and, and access to some of that information from a commercial perspective can be commercially sensitive. Um, and so how the register um, or how this information whether it be in the land register or it be in a, in a separate register, can be accessed and by whom and for what reasons, I think is also um, you know, something that needs to be given consideration. Do my colleagues will have some questions on that. Um, I'm going to move on to John. Um, thank Fox. you, convener. And finish, uh, starting where Anne Stewart has just finished and discussing the process of accessing information, uh, both Global Witness and the Community uh, Land Scotland highlighted the process of accessing information in the register as potentially onerous. Um, so, Anne Stewart has already um, highlighted concerns about that. Others might want to just talk ar around what are the key concerns of the proposed process of accessing information. How could the process of accessing information be simplified? Should it be simplified? But how could it be? Um, so access and simplification. Do you want to carry on, Anne? Um, Scotless has been mentioned already, and um, Scotless is potentially a model because it's, it's a, there are two tiers of access to Scotless. There's the open public access, uh, which provides a limited amount of information, and then there's um, access by registered users. Um, largely at the moment, uh, we access, um, in my firm, and legal firms will access Scotless through their registration for um, other services, application forms, and, and, and all the rest of it that we need for land registration. And that gives us, um, there's a paywall there um, uh, through which you go to download certain information, but there is still you know, quite a bit of information that's, that's free. Um, so um, if Scotless is, is going to be the, the vehicle or the receptacle for this information, if it's going to be a, a, an element of, of that register, then um, that slightly more restricted access would mean that um, uh, you know, 
there was people with a genuine interest in uh, uh, accessing that information had that that step to go through um, uh, before they could they could actually retrieve that information is one one approach others have views on the difficulties of accessing information Megan McInnes? Um, Yes, this is something that we had also we had picked up on in our in the submission that we, we put forward. There is, um, in our view, this is not necessarily a particularly user friendly model that's been put forward in the draft regulations. It has also been made further complicated by the fact that the draft regulations are excluding certain types of uh, certain entities which currently own land because who are because of the fact that they are already providing beneficial ownership. Uh, information to registers in other other types of registers, such as the PSC register at the UK level. Uh, the consequence of this is that if, if a member of the public wants to access this information about who owns a particular piece of land, there's a number of steps they will have to go through. They'll have to first access the land register or the register of SACINs to find out who the who, to find the name of the entity registered as the owner of the land. Then they'll have to work out what type of entity that where they can find the beneficial ownership information for that entity and then go to the correct register to access that information, whether it's the, this, this new register of controlling interests or the PSC register, for example. Um, another, another third layer of complexity has been introduced by the UK government's proposed um, new regulations on foreign entities, which will create an entirely different register, also managed by Companies House at the UK level. This is not necessarily a very easy system for... Uh, people to navigate, especially those without, uh, you know, legal knowledge or advice or, of how the routes of how to access this information. The fact that it is free is something we've been very supportive of, and we certainly think that reduces one of the barriers. Um, but it's not the most straightforward way of accessing this information. Um, in terms of how it, you asked how it could be simplified, <laughs> uh, we are struggling to come up with simple ways for how this could be simplified, given the route that the government has chosen to take <coughs> in firstly creating this as a separate register and secondly excluding certain entities from the registration requirements under this, this draft regulation because those inherently create complexities which within the draft regulations that we have here it's difficult to see a way of simplifying those things. Um, one element though we think that does need further consideration is whether or not the this balance between the need to avoid the problem of double reporting which was the justification for those exclusions is, is balanced against the public interest purposes of this regulation and the extent to which its primary purpose in terms of the public interest is being met. Um, the other consideration, um, which I, I expect will come to later, but I just want to mention now is that there's a, there's a difference between information which is required by the register, any register, and information which is then being publicly disclosed. And the PSC register, for example, at the UK level, requires some information to be registered by, in this case, Companies House, but not all of that information is actually publicly accessible. So we can also consider there's a two-tier system that could be used here as well, uh, where you can um, address some of the issues that are concerned and raised around com commercial, in commercial confidentiality issues. So that's, another, another, that's a possible solution, but without knowing the details of how this is going to work yet, which we don't yet have in the regulation, it's, it's difficult to know the extent to which that would be potentially a route of simplification. Dr. McLeod wanted to come in as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, th th there is a temptation for you just to say, yes, what she said, but I'll, I'll resist that. And um, move on. Uh, I'm trying to put myself in the position of, of, of somebody who would be wanting to use this register in practice. All of us probably, I, I would have thought one way or the other, and frankly it does seem like a fairly daunting prospect. Um, I, I, just, this is just an observation. You had 12 responses to this, uh, your consultation, your written responses, I think. Is that correct in terms of, of, of this? this? Now, on the one hand, that might suggest that there's, there's a lack of interest or demand to, for people to know in relation to, to, to these issues. I think that the opposite is the case. I think people, I'm talking about the general public here, uh, need to have a, a better sense and be better informed in terms of what, ironically, the information rights they have or will have in relation to uh, these issues actually are. So I think there's a big um, public awareness issue that needs to be kind of driven through in terms of this. That's a more general comment when the regulations come in. 
But if we're talking about the actual accessibility of the <coughs> register itself, I mean, I think what Megan says is, is entirely correct in terms of the, the mismatch between potentially uh, this register when it comes through and, and the other ones. But, you know, what are the kind of electronic links that you can actually put in to actually uh, link into to this register and other ones as well? Uh, what is the type of information that you can provide in relation to that, whether it's through specific um, instructions and, and so on in relation to that? And, and, and also, in terms of the level of data that's, that's provided to, um, I think it, it would be very helpful to actually have a kind of open data perspective in terms of, of how this is, is delivered in practice. In other words, enabling people, <coughs> the public primarily, uh, and, and, and other more specific stakeholders as well, to actually have access within the bounds of commercial confidentiality, of course, and respecting all that, have the scope to actually access as much of this data as possible, frankly. So there's, there's issues around how you access it and, and, and what the mechanisms are in terms of that. So these would broadly be where, where, where you would we should put that. But I absolutely recognise our challenges, of course, of doing that in practice. Just got a, a short question, and if we've got time, I'll come to Stuart Stevenson. Mr Sinclair wanted to speak first, I think. Sorry. Sorry. Um, in terms of accessibility, there are, I think, two ways, generally ways, in which you're going to be looking at this register. One is going to be from the, the top down, looking at the people that have controlling interests and whether one individual has controlling interests over a large number of, a num <coughs> a large number of properties. Um, the other is going to be from the bottom up, where you have a piece of land where you wish to work out who actually is controlling that piece of land. And I think that the um, accessibility of the register, which is absolutely key to, there's no point in having a register if it is not accessible and useful. But looking at those two particular, or two different purposes in, in accessing the register, you have two different issues, or you have different issues with accessibility. For the top-down approach, where you're looking to try and understand how, how much land is controlled by a particular individual, then that would generally be the name searching function. And on that basis, it would be useful to have much the same, infor well, much the same information as is contained in the PSC register, as is contained in the uh, ROCI register. Um, from the bottom up, um, Scotless is a wonderful thing and is, is just going to get better with time. Um, Scotless is a very easy tool for finding land that is registered in the 2012 land register. Um, it is less useful uh, when you're looking at seizing titles. And so for seizing titles, you're generally reduced to um, uh, searching against a, a verbal uh, description of the property. Um, and that can actually be very, very difficult. And so uh, the point I'm really moving to making is that um, is that the, um, the search, one of the issues with accessibility is going to be searching against seizing titles. Um, but it is an issue that will be getting better over time. And so that this, the, the need, um, it will become easier to search the register as time goes on and as completion of the land register proceeds. Just, just briefly, I mean, how many, as a lay person, how many registers are there likely to be with the UK Overseas Entities Register, the Crofting Register, the existing registers? Just roughly, are we talking five, seven? Give, taking disclosures in as well. What are we looking at here? How are people going to know which one to go to? I, I don't have a list, I'm afraid, but I mean, off the top of my head, at the UK level, you'll have the, the UK companies, <coughs> in company size, you have the you'll have the new register of foreign entities then we'll have in scotland we'll have the land register itself we'll have the register of seizings although hopefully we'll be everything will be merging into the land register you will have this register you then have the crofting register and then you have all the other registers that the keeper is responsible for managing such as the various different registers around the you know community right to buy and, and other other burdens and the piece of registers which have a specific relationship with a piece of land so that's at least six uh, That's enough to be going on with. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Jason. Yeah. Yeah. Jason. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> simply to add, in our special analysis, we didn't um, particularly major on this year of the 
accessibility in terms of um, how you um, access, as opposed to, to more of the actual, the, in terms of the physical access, it was more on the actual accessibility of the regulations themselves, which almost the, um, the next stage. Um, so it's only to, to add that. Thank you. Stuart, you had a, a short supplement. Very specifically uh, to Dr. McLeod, what would constitute proper con commercial confidentiality that would mean information should not be disclosed? I can think of none. I do accept for personal safety reasons there might be reasons, but for commercial confidentiality, could we give me an example of a legitimate cause? But when you say that, I can't think of an example right. either, so well, I'll probably I see the withdraw that, that from my approach. <clears throat> yeah, um, if allowed. Yeah. I think uh, that would be a, a good question for Anne Stewart, because you were the, the person that brought this up yes. in the first place, so perhaps you could... Well, probably general examples rather than specific ones. I mean, certainly you know, financial um, uh, information that could be confidential, perhaps, um, you know, that could affect uh, the way the market perceives certain organisations um, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, there are... Sorry, may I interrupt and say, we're generally talking about first, second charges and so on and so forth, which would be registered. Uh, with titles, but they are registered there precisely so they are a matter of public record, aren't they, for example? Yeah, yes, sir. What, what uh, I, I was meaning was the information about um, the extent of um, the shareholding in a particular organisation by a person who has, uh, has control, that kind of information. Sorry, under the Companies Act, uh, share registers are publicly accessible in or, real time. Or, or the, the, it, for, the, for the example, for the overseas entity, there, there's a sort of percentage which is similar to the company's register. Uh, well, there's a, there's a percentage under the, un, under the stock exchange rules whereby they have to declare and there are levels at which you have to then bid for the, the rest of the company and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. All sorts of, let's not go there. But, but it is a matter of public record. So I'm just struggling to know why for commercial reasons there is any reason it would ever be denied. John Sinclair wants to come in and then we'll go to Megan McInnes. Mr Sinclair. One of the areas we had discussed in the Law Society was a scenario where you have a company which is about to be sold. Um, I think if that company entered into exclusivity agreements or a lockout agreement to prevent it dealing with its assets, then I think technically that would then, the, the company that it entered into that arrangement with would technically be an associate and would therefore need to be disclosed on the register, which means that there would then be a public record of a discussion that would have legitimate reasons for being commercially sensitive, if nothing, of, and would also, if the information got out, would cause disquiet amongst the employees of the, the company, the registered proprietor. And how does that cut across the need to advise the stock exchange of uh, things that where it's a quoted company? Um, that I cannot comment on. I am right. Well, we may be convenient. We'll move on. Can I just a point to make on this? Yeah, sorry. I, I, I made the reference to commercial confidentiality, sort of it, it, the fact that often you have registers that operate in two different levels, and not necessarily everything which is given to a register is, is then publicly disclosed. Global Witness's view from the very beginning is that um, because of the fact that this new register is trying to improve transparency around, benef around the ownership of land, for the, for the reason that we currently don't know who owns and is ultimately behind some pieces of land. There is clearly a reason why there are some entities who want to, rem, rem, who have up until now wanted to remain anonymous. Therefore, we think it's very important and we agree with what's proposed in the regulation that there's a very, very, very specific and narrow reason simply to do with what's described in the security declaration of, of what information should not be disclosed. And we are happy with that, I think, anything broader. When you're talking simply about the information which is going to be proposed by this regulation, which is around the name and the contact address and, you know, the, the, those very specific information, that's, but that's, um, we're, we're happy with what's proposed within the regulation. It matches at the PSC register and international standards. And I think to, to, to expand that list of the information that shouldn't be disclosed any larger would be creating loopholes, which would result in the regulations not having the desired effect.
Callum Cloud, you, have you got a further point to make? A very, very brief comment in relation to what Mr Stevenson said and, and colleagues on the panel as well. You can probably tell that I'm, I, I'm not a lawyer on, on the panel. I'm the one in the cheap suit. But uh, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really... Um, I think it is important to uh, stress that point in relation to you know what, what the what the policy thrust of this this uh, set of regulations are in the register is in, in relation to transparency ultimately and so just to reiterate what, what Megan's saying that it's it's really it is really important we, we would suggest to to, to keep um, the exclusions or reasons to exclude information or access to information to a minimum quite honestly in relation to that because We've seen it in submissions, but I'm sure we'll come to it in, in, in discussion in the session. There, there, there are lots of, of reasons thrown up as to why not to do things, but there are also really important reasons as to why to do them. And what this committee and what this parliament has been doing over the last number of years in relation to um, transparency and, and ownership aspects in relation to that is, is, is about trying to sh shed some light in relation to that. So I just think that's a really important point to, to bear in mind, which I'm sure we all do in that. Now, I know that Anne Stewart wants to come back in, but I'm actually, I think there'll be opportunity for you to make your point later. I'm going to go to Richard uh, Lyle for further line of question. Uh, Mr McCallum made uh, reference to submissions. Actually, there's one good one from the Law Society. I'm sure Mr Sinclair will uh, want to respond to us. So in the submissions, the Law Society of Scotland were certainly not happy with two particular sections of Regulation 2. Section A, the Law Society is of view that expression 2A, direct the activities of an, another, is open to wide interpretation. And similarly, 2C is considered open to uncertainty. The Law Society of Scotland believes that adopting much of the language and the terminology of the PSC regime, people with significant control, must be, may be misguided. So could I ask you in particular, and I'm sure other people may want to respond to this, but uh, Mr Sickler, what, what do you believe, uh, what makes you believe the wording in Regulation 2 is open to wide interpretation and as it is drafted, why is it not significantly clear to avoid uncertainty? <clears throat> First time I've stumped a lawyer. <laughs> <clears throat> they are nebulous in concept and hard to objectively demonstrate, which doesn't really add much to, to the response. Uh, for example, in 2C, you have significant, significant influence is a reference to where a pers person is able to ensure that another person will typically adopt the approach. Um, as, a, as a, a rule to apply, this has got lots of difficulties with it. Um, the concept of typically uh, could require um, an, ex uh, an analysis of a, a pattern of behaviour. And so if you're looking at patterns of behaviour, you have to consider um, how, how, how comprehensive or how, what period of time are you looking at for the pattern of behaviour, what degree of variance between um, always... Um, uh, adopting the approach recommended or you know, typically adopts the approach means it's not 100%. And so is it 99%, is it 90 is it 85 um, or is it a typically adopts approach in relation to certain types of matters? Um, you then have a juxtaposition, juxtaposition between the word ensure, which generally means that something is bound to happen. And so you, you juxtapose ensure bound to happen with a typically does something. And so there is, there is a difficulty in understanding how that wording will actually be implemented in practice. Um, I'm not saying that we could come up with anything better in terms of a, a sort of a, a, an absolute test, but I think that um, the idea of fuller guidelines being produced in terms of examples and models of what would count as typical um, would be very, very helpful. Um, if only because you're then expecting someone to decide at what point in time has something become a, a typical pattern of behaviour. And inevitably, when you look back at something with hindsight, it then becomes very uncertain at which point you hit the tipping point between it being um, typically or, or uh, um, less frequent. And so if you're going to back this up or you're going to enforce this with a criminal sanction, we were keen that it would be 
simpler and easier, to, or not easier, but simpler and more objective to be able to identify whether someone was or was not about to commit an offence or had committed an offence. Do you have concerns about uh, <coughs> extending the role of the trusted advisor uh, to often held by professional advisors? And are there, in order to progress this, are there other problems resulting from the use of terminology from the persons of significant control? And if there are, how should these concerns be addressed? I think in terms of the last point, how these would be, could be addressed, I think uh, it would be better for us to produce a further written response to that rather than for you to have me answer that off, off the cuff. <laughs> Second anomaly from the solicitor. Um, <clears throat> The trusted, sorry, the trusted advisor point, um, it, again, it's very, very, it, it shows you the, the sort of the difficulty between the boundaries between a trusted advisor where if a trusted advisor is good, then more often than not, perhaps typically, the advice that they give will be followed by the client. And so if you compare that pattern of behaviours where there is a correlation between advice and action taken by the client, that doesn't necessarily mean that anything other than that the advice is good and well measured rather than exercising a significant control. And so for the exceptions that you have for paid advisors, it's an exception for a paid advisor only when that is their only function. So to, to, to finish this up, and, and unless anyone else has any other comments, um, do you have any problems with, with the use of the terminology from the person of significant control register? Do you have any problems with that? No, I, 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 I can. I would prefer to answer that in, or produce that or provide that in a further written response. I look forward to it. Thank you. Megan McKenna has um, some points she wants to make. I, I don't want to comment on on the Lost Society submission, but I think that one of the ways in which the the PSC <coughs> register has overcome similar problems, where you're trying to find ways of creating clear definitions of quite nebulous means of controlling an entity and controlling the, decision, you know, the, the decisions that are made around that entity is by providing um, further examples, very specific examples in the explanatory notes, which can, which can demonstrate situations which would and would not fall under the intentions of the, um, of the regulation. So that's one way of, 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 of addressing these, the degree of complexity would be to be asking the government for more, for more examples in a further explanatory document. Um, I just also wanted to touch on this question of whether or not the PSC register and terminology is useful or not for this, for what we're trying to achieve here in Scotland. Um, because I think we would take a slightly different position than some of the other members of the panel here in terms of the fact that we, we do think that the, the PSC register is quite a useful um, mechanism that, we, that, that, that Scotland can learn from for, for two reasons. Firstly, the concepts, firstly, the fact that historically the concept of beneficial ownership, whether you're saying beneficial ownership or whether you're using other terminology such as persons of, with controlling interests, is not something which was created purely for anti-money laundering and tax-focused tax efforts. It's actually got a concept in law much, old, much older than that, and which is around the, the need to um, get clarification around one who enjoys the benefits of a property or, an, or owning an asset without without being the legal owner. So it's, that's, it's the underlying concept there. The PSC register is one register which brings that concept into practice through a particular mechanism. The Scottish Government is trying to do something, something using a different mechanism for a different purpose, but using the same tool in terms of the clarity around how that control, how that, the benefit and control is, is, how the benefit is gained and the control is exerted over that, that, that piece of property. So I think that we shouldn't be distracted from the fact, I think there's a lot that can be learnt from the PSC register in terms of how it's worked and the terminology used that is useful, even though the purpose of the PSC register is for addressing money laundering and tax issues, rather than the purpose of this regulation is around transparency of land ownership. So I, I just think we need to be careful to not, the, the purpose might be different, but the mechanism can be the same, and there's, a very, there's some very useful lessons that can be learned in terms of how the PSC register has worked up until now, which and we gave some examples in our submission that I think the, that we think the Scottish Government could, could do well to learn from in terms of making sure that this register doesn't fall through the, some of the same hurdles, because it's extremely complicated, and setting up registers like this are, are not easy to do. Jason Rust. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Um, just to touch on the member's <coughs> point regarding the linkage with the um, persons of significant control, um, I think we would agree with um, many of the points Megan's made in terms of the purpose may be different, but the mechanism could be looked at. But I think you know, concern, for instance, that we had was that in um, part two of Schedule 1 at, at um, point four, where it um, relates to compliance, the draft regulations actually relate to a definition of the persons of significant <coughs> control. And we think that sort of things may be of concern for you're looking at these regulations, but then having to go and look at further regulations elsewhere to understand um, exactly how you would comply with these. We move on to questions. Thank you. Uh, from Finlay Carson, followed by Claudia Beamish. Uh, thanks. Um, okay, I, I was moving on to part two, where the, the information is uh, laid out in the, the register. And I think you've probably been all over the, the, this, this next question. I was going to ask how the terms controlled and significant influence could be misinterpreted and, and in what uh, instances that might be what someone sets out to do uh, and whether there needs to be further definition uh, or explanation. But on the back of that, uh, I'd also like to ask, do, does the panel think there's, there's any uh, grounds for it being made easier to avoid identification by not recording uh, the home or permanent address of the recorded person? Tackle that first. Just say your question again. Um, well, the, the first part was just in, in part two, regulation three, uh, the, the terms again, I think you probably covered it, the, the terms controlled and significant influence. And in what instances do you think those could be deliberately misinterpreted? And should there be more uh, definitions to avoid that? That was the first part of the question. I think probably from, from what John has, has said, that um, greater clarity about what significant influence or, or, or controlling is actually uh, supposed to mean uh, would certainly help. Because I, I, I think there um, uh, are, are going to be instances where you will look at a, a pattern of behaviour or, or a relationship. Uh, between um, uh, owners and non-owners uh, of, a, of a piece of land and, and not be able to say with certainty, yes, you are on this side of the line and you, and you fit the definition or not. There, there will be instances um, simply because of that, the, the, the typicality of, of, of that behaviour where, where that's going to be difficult. So, yes, I think uh, uh, there certainly needs to be um, a, a, a clearer... Um, and, and probably, rather than running on for pages and pages I in terms of a definition, John's suggestion of, of plenty of examples. I think the explanatory notes are um, uh, the legislation requires the, explan the explanatory document to give reasons for uh, all of these things and um, you know, examples and, and that sort of thing would, would clarify that. At the moment, that's absent from the explanatory document. Mm. Um. Anyone else want to answer that? John Sinclair. I think the test is always going to have to be nebulous because you're dealing with um, things like influence and control. And so, yes, um, the idea of having more examples to give people greater guidance as to what is or is not going to be satisfying that test would be very, very helpful. In terms of your question about the home address, I think that the PSC requires both a home address and a service address. Um, the idea, I think the purpose, I'm saying the purpose of the address is to allow you to identify that one person named something in particular is the same as another person named that thing. And so the idea that you can use an address to um, identify the individual precisely, I think is a very, very useful tool. Whether it needs to be a home address or a service address um, is, um, I think, less significant given that part of it is to identify the individual, part of it is to allow access and contact with the individual. And so long as the individual is obliged to provide the same address for every entry on the register, you would be achieving the same result, whether Could it's a personal or a service. Address. I have some questions around that. I think, yeah, yeah. If you don't mind, yeah. I'll just hear from other I'll come back panel members then. because I may not need to ask questions, in, yeah. in, depending on how they respond, if that's all right. If there are other Megan McInnes. Yes, thank you. I, just, I also wanted just to touch on the, the member's second question around this question of residential addresses or 
other other ways of making sure that the um, we're really able to identify the correct person in terms of who the person with controlling interest are. Um, certainly from Global Witnesses' perspective, there is, there is concern, and this is demonstrated by the, um, the way in which the PSC register has operated until now, that having a month and year and name of the, of the individual isn't, isn't enough information to be sure that you can definitely find the right person. There are a number of solutions to this. I think one of the, one of the problems of having a residential address is that there are issues around, you know, the, where that solution, um, there are issues around security which have to be recognised in relation to publishing residential addresses. An alternative solution to this problem which Global Witness has been recommending is that unique identifying numbers are created for each individual, each natural person, the first time they enter their, they, they become a they enter their information on this register, and that's, it, it's the unique reference number, which is the way in which you can then check how this person is then also having to register subsequently in the same register, because they're, they're, they are a controlling um, person in relation to other, other pieces of land and, and property. So that's an alternative way of addressing this, which, which overcomes some of the challenges around security of having a residential address included in the register. And uh, Jason Russ wanted to make some comment on this. Um, yes, it was more in the first point, really, to agree with um, the points made by Anne and John earlier that, about the importance of the explanatory document and having further examples, because I think a certain concern at Scottish Land and Estates was just about the... We mentioned um, part two earlier, but also part one of schedule one, just the, the, the ambit of these regulations and the scope and to the extent to um, the types of category of person that they will apply to. Um, for instance, I, mean, I think it states in the explanatory documents that a cohabiting partner spouse would be exempt but that's not necessarily clear from the from the drafting um, and also the business we discussed earlier in terms of professional advisors and the fact that in many instances a professional advisor in a paid capacity may be exempt but in other situations where they're acting as an executor um, or what have you they, they might not be and I think it's just maybe getting clarity uh, through examples either through the explanatory document or potentially through schedule two and actually um, having a list in there of the types of um, persons to whom they would, would, wouldn't apply. Stuart seems wants to pick on that up on um, point there. I, I just see an analogue with the uh, Companies Act to regulations in relation to shadow directors. Is that a reasonable place to look for whether someone should or should not be? And of course there's a lot of case law around that. I'll need to check that and come back to you, but I mean, certainly there will be other examples um, out there, I'm sure that, I mean, I think essentially what we're after is something um, fairly straightforward that may not be able to just be picked completely off the shelf of another no, no, act, no. but um, yes, I'm sure there is a, a basis for... It, it may be worth saying I am not a lawyer, contrary to a mere mathematician. Would it be, Miss? Uh, just to pursue these issues a little further, um, obviously, uh, the, the purpose, the main purpose, as we've heard this morning, um, is uh, the public interest purpose um, of, of these regulations. And uh, that's for a range of reasons, but mostly, uh, <coughs> well, maybe not mostly, but one of the important reasons is the accessibility from those who want to um, further their possible interest in, in the purchase of land. And land transparency is absolutely fundamental to that. So. Um, I wonder if we could just tease these issues out a little bit more about um, a service address and, and uh, the possibility, and this is not to in any way disparage a professional. Professionals need protection. Prof professional advisors need protection. But if the address is only goes as far as the professional advisor, there, are, there seem to be all sorts of ways in which if anyone, and I stress if anyone, wished to hide what they owned or hide that they were the owner or... Um, not just at the point of sale, which is complex, I agree, but in, in a general sense, because there are these problems in Scotland, then what is the very best way to be most sure that we can find the owner of land? Or are there lots of ways that have to come together? It's a bit of an unfair question, perhaps, but... I really want to tease this out. Um, why, why shouldn't we, apart from security, sorry, but apart from security reasons like in relation to if there's um, somebody who has been the victim of domestic violence or something of that kind, which is a, a, a confidential um, a confidentiality issue, but I don't think there, in my view, there aren't reasons commercially mm. yeah. uh, for 
that. So let's just tease this out a bit more, please. Callum Cloud. I, I, I think it's a really important question. I genuinely cannot see a reason why uh, that type of information should not be fully accessible to the general public for a very important and powerful public interest rationale, basically, in, in terms of that. There are many communities throughout Scotland in, in rural settings and in urban settings as well that are uh, often looking to, to, to buy land and, 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 and community ownership, which is obviously the, the organisation that I represent in terms of membership there. Um, and in order for them to do that in some instances, uh, clearly they need to know who is the, the controlling interest in relation to that. So I think the public interest test is, is, is pretty clear in relation to that. And so I, I, I cannot, and I don't think Community Land Scotland would, would be able to mount, uh, and you wouldn't expect us to, a convincing argument as to why you shouldn't, as a member of the public, as a community group or organisation, have uh, as, as much accessibility in terms of that level of information as possible in relation to that. Now, what that means in practice in relation to the type of data that's, that's included, well, I think we would certainly echo some of the, the previous comments in relation to, to, to making sure that the points of access and, and the types of information are as full and as robust and as verifiable as possible in relation to that. Yes, I think there is a bit of a difficulty, though, um, uh, because the member gave one example of perhaps uh, individuals trying to find out who owns land because they're interested in buying it. Um, but there are probably many reasons why people might want to find out who, who owns land. And there's a sort of you know, fundamental question which isn't really addressed um, in, in these regulations is, you know, who are you trying to find and why are you trying to find them? Um, and it may be a completely different person if you want to, you're interested in buying the land than if actually somebody's tree's fallen on your garage and you want to find out who you know, can, can, can deal with that. And there will be perhaps different people will be the, the person to contact depending on the circumstances. So to say that you know, there's one solution which will, will, will fit them all. What possible reason? If you could explain, because I don't understand, what possible reason could there be for secrecy and lack of transparency? I mean, what, you know, what, what is there to hide in terms of land ownership? I don't understand. Well, I think we were, we were talking earlier about residential addresses, which is yes. where this, this, this came from. And, and certainly, I think there is that, um, uh, uh, the, the security aspect of that. People may well be perfectly happy to know that they are the owner of land, but they don't necessarily want somebody coming up to their front door the identity of the person who's, forgive me, for Claudia. So, I, I mean, that's I, what, what you're meaning, it's the identity of the person. The contactability as well, yeah. convener, and, and I, I mean, I think maybe if, if that's all right, Callum wanted to add something to that, Callum yeah. McDonald. Sorry, to Mr. Stevenson, but, but just to come back, back on that, um, you know, uh, the question of, of who owns Scotland, for, for long enough, the answer to that question has been pass. That is not acceptable in a, a progressive, democratic society, which is what Scotland is and what we collectively as a, as a, as a, as a country actually hold ourselves up as. And frankly, you, you know, in that context, it, it should be perfectly possible, in fact, not even difficult for um, interested parties to actually find out that kind of basic information, frankly. Megan McInnes wanted to make a point, and I'm going to move on to Alec Rowley's questions. Um, yes, I mean, I would, have, I would agree very much with the question and what, and what Callum has just said in terms of ultimately we have to, you know, we should and must be able to know who ultimately owns land. Global Witnesses' concerns with this in the regulation is, is actually much deeper than, than the question you just asked um, because it's not just a question of whether or not it's the service address or the residential address or an email or, or you know, should, should, you know is, is, is email better than sending a letter as I know that I think you discussed with the, sponsor, with the, the policy team when, in the previous hearing. There's actually some there's some questions we have about the fundament the, the nature the fundamental way that these regulations are structured, which I think also do not will not let us ultimately know who owns the land. There is, for example, it's not clear from the regulations that they will actually be able to always ultimately disclose the natural persons, the human beings behind the land. Um, so in some cases, it's only going to end end up taking us to yet another non-natural legal entity. This is demonstrated in diagram four in the regulations where you end up with just a trustee and not going any further. 
um, you have this problem as um, as the uh, this submission made by, by Andy Whiteman, MSP, where he shows just a, a circular control structure, which ultimately will just take you round and round in circles. Um, we have concerns about what's being proposed here and at the UK level for the PSC register of the 25% voting threshold and the regulations, the draft regulations to give an example where with a 25% threshold for voting, you, you would end up with a number of um, entities holding less than 25% who again aren't required to disclose ultimately who the, non, who the natural persons are ultimately having that controlling interest. Um, so that's one area where we think that the regulations aren't clear and won't, even as they're drafted at the moment, won't let us get to that, that natural, the natural persons at the end. Another concern is that the way in which the regulations are drafted, it's not clear yet how a member of the public will know if the register of controlling interest is complete or not. There's no way of knowing at the moment in the way that the regulations are drafted as far as our analysis is, is it's not possible to know whether or not, if there's not a recorded person and associate registered for a piece of land, it's, no, we don't, it's not possible to know whether or not that's because that information should be there but is not yet being registered, or whether there isn't actually any recorded, any, any eligible recorded person or associate. So it won't be possible to have a complete picture of the extent to which what's in the register is incomplete or complete um, and that for the missing plots of land, there just isn't enough information. The, that information is not available. But, but how would you see that, that being solved? Well, again, it goes back to this question of how this register relates to the land register and whether the Scotless, whether the Scotless portal, portal would be able to give you a clearer indication of some kind of uh, flag up on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a title of land where that information is missing or whether there isn't or whether there isn't a recorded person or associate okay. eligible. Because okay. um, at the moment, that, that does, there doesn't seem to be a procedure in, in the regulations to enable to We've got to a number that. of uh, members wanting to come in in the back of that for very short supplementaries before I go to Alec Rowley for his length questioning. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Finlay Carson. Um, I just wanted to slightly explore the cases where we do not wish to disclose the honour. Women's refugees would be an example. It's not the only example that people can appear on the electoral register for safety reasons without an address, for example. Very few. Um, but in particular, if the limit of people who are secret is very small for very specific reasons, doesn't that carry with it the risk of identifying what is being concealed? Um, so Humphrey Appleby said, uh, he, would, he who would a secret keep must first keep secret that he would, has a secret to keep. In other words, the very fact that something is shown as not disclosed might disclose. So how do we deal with that really quite difficult issue of those instances where we must not disclose? Can one person answer that and then I'll come to Finley Carson for his Megan, supplementary because we are kind of running out of time. Does somebody want to answer that? With a yes, just, Minister quote or just not? Just very, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to give you quotes. I, I think that um, all we can do at this point is learn from how this has worked in practice for the PSC register, where in, in, in actual case the number of, of agreed exemptions to, for these purposes, it's, I can't, the terminology is different from the security declaration, but the purpose is the same, is actually extremely small in terms of those which are actually go through the, the, the request and, and agreement process. So, yes... I think it, it, um, it is a possibly a problem if you're able to tell that a particular plot there has been an agreement that information is redacted, but it doesn't tell you why. And most importantly, it doesn't, doesn't disclose the information which the person has asked it to be withheld. And I think that, that's, that's the security. So that security barrier is still there in terms of the protection of the information. Uh, Finley Carson, have you got a, still got a question to ask? Uh, yes. Short question. Uh, Regulation 6 and 7 relate to the protection of and access to RCI. However, uh, it doesn't actually uh, reference or recognise independent standard when it comes to security. How would you uh, deal with that and, and, and cover any concerns that might be in regards to the security of the information and access to it? Sorry, convenient, if you don't mind. I mean, Global Witness 
doesn't um, have too many concerns about the security. We think that what's in place at the moment is adequate. We do have concerns, though, that it might be misused. And therefore, our recommendation and submission was that, the, um, in, again, to match the PSC registers operations, that the keeper would be required to annually report statistics on the, the number of exemption requests they'd received and how many had been, had been, um, had been, how many had been accepted. Um, and that's more just to make sure that this, this, this mechanism is, is, is functioning, is fit for purpose, essentially. We don't have, but I, know, I, think maybe, I don't know whether other panellists have comments of suggestions of, about strengthening security procedures. Okay. I'm going to move on to Alec Rowley, who has some questions to ask on a different theme. Thank you. I note that the, the Law Society, in its evidence, states that there needs to be upfront clarity in terms of the types of owner and tenant that are exempt from the regulation. Uh, so my question would be around who should be caught by the regulations and who should be exempt. Is it correct that the regulations apply to all those with a control and interest? So the Law Society give examples where there is, doesn't seem to be any difference between the local sports club and the large commercial organisation or between the small family partnership and the major pension fund. Um, and then the, the Scottish Property Federation, they, they then go on to say, and I quote, the investors or beneficiaries of a collective investment fund may be somewhat removed from control in the fund. And this begs the question of what the register of control and interest will actually achieve. So does, does the other panel members agree with those, those concerns being raised? Um, and at the end of the day, who should be caught by regulation and there should, should there be exemption and differential between large sports, cl or sports clubs and pension funds? Callum McLeod. Um, without rehashing my previous answer, I'm going to go back to my previous answer to uh, Claudia Beamish's uh, question, which is the exemption should be at the bare minimum, frankly, in, in, in terms of who, who is exempted from it and taking on board the security issues that we've already discussed. Um, this needs to be as, as wide ranging as possible in terms of um, the, the data that it collects in, in relation to the register and, and who's on it, basically, for the, the issues around transparency, democracy and accountability that we've rehearsed earlier on. I think it's that fundamental, frankly. And Stuart. I think um, that, that kind of leads to uh, what the issue which I think Callum actually touched on briefly earlier, which is uh, about how do people know whether they're supposed to be doing something uh, and putting some information on this register or not. At the moment, um, strictly speaking, everybody who owns land would have to wade their way through these regulations to find out whether or not they're supposed to be doing something. And, and that's quite an important thing for people to, to know whether or not they have to, given the, the severe penalties that, that could apply if they do have a duty under these regulations and fail to comply with that duty. And in a way, um, in, in terms of you know, the, the, the sort of examples that you gave from the Law Society and, and, and other submissions is, it should be easy and, and, and uh, the, the prime thing should be that it should be very obvious to people whether or not they, they need to be worried about putting something into this register. That should be clear, that should be you know, posted up front. So you don't have to worry if um, it's a husband and wife um, uh, and the husband, the title's in the, in the husband's name or the wife's name, these sorts of situations. You, you may be in a partnership, but all the partners own the land. That's fine. You don't need to worry about that. So it's, it's actually, it's not so much making sure that's fine, I'm exempt. It's actually knowing that I don't have to do anything um, or the situ circumstances in which I do have to put something on this register so that I'm not, you know, uh, guilty of, of committing a criminal offence, which is, which is quite a severe penalty, you know, just for owning land. Would anyone else like to add any comments? Stuart Stevenson's got a question. Um, I just wondered if Anne Stewart's answer covered both registered and unregistered partnerships. Because, of course, unregistered partnerships are, by their very nature, uh, the details are not known. It's, it's not so much about the details are not known. You know, one would hope that the partnership would know um, that 
who, who its partners were. It's, it's, a, it's a different approach uh, that I'm talking about. Um, and, and the fact that there will be a lot of people who quite innocently and inadvertently fail to comply with duties under these regulations to put information on the register for no reason other than that they are oblivious. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to answer the members' uh, question specifically. I think global witness perspective in terms of whether or not the regulations capture those who should be caught by our, our, our concerns are actually different in terms of the fact that we're worried that the complexity of the regulation creates potential loopholes which might be exploited by those who want to be able to continue to remain anonymous for the reasons that up until now they have not made this information public. Um, there are, um, there is an, an unfortunate small, in Global Witnesses' experiences, an unfortunate small proportion of, uh, of, 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 of lawyers who make a living out of helping entities who want to remain anonymous or you know, avoid certain regulations, uh, find loopholes in order to do that. And what we welcome with this regulation is that the, the way in which it's drafted is, is very inclusive and that the, the, the entities which are excluded are very small and very limited. And we hope that that will, be, that will have the, um, that, that, that approach will enable the, the keeper and the Scottish Government to make sure that even in the future, if there are new types of corporate vehicles which are created, that they will still be able to be captured by these regulations to ensure that we don't end up with simply ownership by those who want to remain in arms moving into types of, of corporate entities which are not covered by these regulations. So the, the breadth and scope is very important, we think, in terms of having that flexibility to adapt to, to, the, to the type of structures that may be created in the future. Um, Cal McLeod wants to come back in. Do you still just want to? Just, just very br briefly to, to observe that there's, there's clearly a difference between um, arguing for, for, for entities to be um, excluded from the register and giving people the information that they need to have confidence as to whether or not they should be doing something in terms of registration in the first place. And we would suggest that the emphasis very much should be on the latter in terms of giving that kind of information and giving them the confidence uh, to be able to, to make that decision as to whether or not they should be registering or not in the interest of this kind of broader disclosure that we already discussed. Okay, Jason Rust. Thank you. Um, going back to the members, um, Mr. Early's initial question, we would agree that there should be across um, the board, and we did note in our submission a few um, a contractual arrangements which we thought had been admitted, such as 1991 Act, as secure agricultural tenancies. Um, but just in them being across the board, I think the only sort of caveat, would be, I think it needs to be borne in mind that um, in terms of the, the sanctions, that um, obviously you could we're looking at large pension fund trusts as well as you know, your small um, family partnerships and local clubs. And I think when it comes to the criminal sanction, um, I think that needs to be um, borne in mind. Um, Alec Riley, do you want to come back in with your follow-up questions? Yeah. Or are you, sorry? <coughs> Two points I want to make. One, the nature of the, the test is so wide, it is going to have far, it will apply very differently to a local sports club as opposed to an investment trust. Um, and that's where the guidance would be helpful. Um, particularly when you're dealing with people who may not think that, that, this le that there is a regis legislation out there that is going to be relevant for them. So publicity and guidance would be very, very good. In terms of people being excluded from um, the regulations, then one of the, the particular um, instances that, that came up in our discussions was the role of executors. Um, and the idea that one of the <coughs> early things you should do once a spouse, family member, or um, anyone that dies is, is to remember to update the register of controlling interests is uh, it is an area where people are likely to be unintentionally criminalized for no real benefit and so where you have an, uh, uh, an executory that is simply being run through its administration um, it would make some sense to have a, a carve out for them okay um, Richard Lyle, you have a question? Uh, most of what I was going to ask already has been covered, but I'm reminded there is a section in the Act to allow for a security declaration. Nowadays, security is paramount. Paramount. So how should the Keeper prioritise security in the registration process? And to include other witnesses, would you like your address being published for all to see? Or should anyone be able to just contact your lawyer? <laughs> 
Mr Sinkler will light this one for a fee. Who would like to go first? That? It has been covered to a certain extent, but if anyone's got any further points to want to Honestly, make. would you like your address being published? Your individual home address being published for all to see? Personally speaking, this isn't an organisational perspective at all. It wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me to, to have that at all. You can go on the electoral roll potentially and see where my, my address is anyway. So, personally speaking, I wouldn't have a problem. In the electoral roll, you can actually ask for it, in, and Stuart Stevenson covered that earlier. MPs can ask for their addresses to be with, withheld from uh, the ballot paper. Uh, I'm pushing for it to be done for councillors. Uh, Stuart Stevenson already reminded us this. You can actually have your uh, address taken off the electoral roll. You can still be on the electoral roll, but your address can be off it. So, you know, OK. Um, and the concern is that people could come up and chap your door. So, honestly, you know, let's be honest. Would we like it or not? I'd like each of you to say yes. Either yes or no, or pass. Yes for me, basically. Yes for you. <laughs> Um, from Global Witnesses' perspective, I think that the solution to this is more is, is better. Is the solution the solution to be able to identify who these who the um, those with controlling interests are is and, and, and map their their the extent of their controlling interest across different pieces of land is better resolved around the, around the question of this having a unique reference number rather than having further information which you're able to cross cross reference in terms of making sure you have the right person. Um, the, as far as I know, whilst the PSC register does require the residential address to be um, provided to the register, it's not disclosed. So the information that's disclosed on the PSC register is a service address, not a residential address. And again, that, that, but that again takes you back to this question of whether or not the, the function of the register can have a two-tier system where it holds some information which is not disclosed, or whether or not everything which is registered is automatically disclosed. Right, just to cut the, cut the chase, and I know Kandina wants me to uh, yeah. hurry along. Would that be the answer, Mr Sinclair? If someone wants to find out, uh, if I own a tree next door or whatever, or I own the house next door to them, they, they could go to a register and see my lawyer as you, and they could contact you and you could say, OK, we'll get that dealt with. Is that not the answer? Or am I barking up the wrong tree? <clears throat> I think it is the answer. that If the purpose of the address is for both identification and contact, then the address needs to work. And so it so safeguards the, the person. They have an address to contact a firm, not an individual's house. They have a, a firm. It's not a tax haven. It's not a whatever you see in the television. But they do have somewhere to contact. If I go into the valuation board, I can go into the register and get where a business is located. So if someone wants to contact me, I'm quite happy if they want to contact my lawyer, all done and dusted. Yes? For time. Sorry. Um, Are we I mean, I if anyone's got anything leave. else to say on that, well, otherwise I'm going to go to Stuart Stevenson. I think I've got the answer. Yeah. yeah. So quickly, John. Yeah. Mine's a relatively straightforward question, although a daft laddie question, but given that we're moving towards further disclosure of everything, it appears, yet in here we're, we're now very concerned about data protection and GDPR compliance. Uh, uh, is, this all, is this all compatible, these two pieces of legislation, the existing one with this new proposed one? Someone got a view on that? is that sorry, global witnesses understanding is that um, there are exemptions in GDPR which would enable member states to continue to disclose inf disclose this type of information if it already existed in statute prior to the introduction of of GDPR so in terms of the sequencing our understanding is that this is not this is, that what is being proposed is compatible with GDPR because it was already introduced in statute Jason Rust. Thank you. Um, yes, I think provided it's obviously compatible with existing data protection laws, then we'd be quite comfortable. But more a general point, I think just in terms of disclosure, that actually there is um, almost a caveat and that somewhat perversely, that the more information that sometimes you seek, then the less transparent the process or system can become because it can be easier to conceal that really pertinent information or make information 
harder to find. So, although obviously we want um, as much transparency as possible, I think there's also um, we need to bear in mind the potential dangers of. Um, I don't mean too much transparency, but. Um, too many or many requirements and disclosing lots of information, some of which is maybe just very ancillary and not actually relevant or what people would be interested in, so that to the extent that key things are um, harder to find for the accessing public. Like like an address, you mean? Um, not so much an address, but I, I, yes, I, I mean um, more generally in, in terms of what's what's being sought. Just sometimes the more information mm. that is being sought. I mean, what would you class as being ancillary? Um, was well, something that's not direct. I mean, uh, in terms of the regulations, it's obviously um, <coughs> identifying the associate. We want to identify the associate, uh, the, the arrangement, the contact details. So, <laughs> it's having those that very clear, um, very straightforward for someone accessing that that information is there. And you wouldn't obviously one wouldn't want a register which is full of lots of other maybe legalese or technical information which doesn't actually help the. All right. The so it comes back to the kind of accessibility yes. question. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I just want to briefly ask some questions on accuracy. I'll just make the observation, I've just literally now, company's house, my Sunday name's James, there are 162,752 director's entries with James Stevenson. Um, there are 71 uh, James Stevensons on the electoral roll in Edinburgh, the public part of the roll. And uh, in the 1935 valuation register, which I could look at there, there are 699 James Stevensons. So therefore, clearly getting accurate and complete information, if you want to find a particular James Stevenson, is important, as these numbers might illustrate. How will we know that what is there is accurate? The, the, the way things are structured, the duty is entirely on the person submitting um, the, the, the registration to be accurate. How might we spot that it's not in the present setup? Does or is anyone... it impossible on what's? Megan McInnes. Yes, this is also something that we had thought quite a bit about um, in terms of the, the, the limited powers that the keeper is currently proposed to be given in terms of, of you know, verifying and investigating. The extent to which this, this information, the information in the register, is correct. Fundamentally, if the, um, uh, to go back to, uh, uh, I mean, a phrase, if, if we have rubbish going into the register, all we will be able to access from the register is is also not not useful information. There are, we have, Global Witness has done a quite a substantial amount of analysis of the extent to which this this problem has occurred within the PSC register, and. Um, we think there are some very important lessons that, that can be learned in terms of the, how this register would, would function in terms of data validation and verification. Just to give some examples, um, uh, the original PSC register was a data-free input, which meant you could put in anything you wanted to any of the answers, and as a, as a result, you had 500 different spellings of nationality for British. You had people uh, listing their nationality as Cornish. You had um, you had. I think two, over 2,000 people um, entering their date, their date of birth as a beneficial owner as 2016 and others far into the future, kind of the year 9,000. 9, 9, so there are some clearly some problems around if you have a, a system which is based on t free text input. The solution to this is there are two levels of the solutions from our perspective. The first is what we're calling data validation, which is the way, the way in which you're making it simpler for the for the information to be correct at the point of receipt. So this can be done through, for example, having, um, instead of free text, multiple drop-down box me menus and, and ways in which entering the data has age prompts and stops you providing being able to put in an age as something in the negative, for example. Um, there's also ways in which you can integrate data validation systems, for example, um, having a check on a UK postal address in order to ver verify that the, the address being put in to the register is, is actually uh, exists. Um, another way of, of addressing this would be at the point of the data entry um, that the, the recorded persons and associates provide proof of ID or if they're a, um, for natural persons or if they're a corporate entity, a non-natural entity, some kind of documents providing provide, uh, evidence of ownership and control of, of the particular piece of land. In terms of the verification question, which we see as the separate stage of, if 
if, if data validation is the point of entry, the point of receipt of the information into the register, data verification in our, in our view is the questions around how the keeper is able to ensure that that data is, is accurate and continues to be accurate moving, moving forward. Um, one, of the, um, one of the ways that this could be done would be to be aligning this, um, this register with um, EU regulations around money laundering, which provide helpful <coughs> guidance in terms of um, member states needing to ensure that this information is accurate. Um, current and adequate, and also are requiring entities that already conduct customer due diligence, such as accountants, real estate agents, banks, to inform um, the, the national authorities or the, 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 uh, the authority, in this case, the keeper, if they find that beneficial ownership information they've been given is different to what's in that register. So there's, there are some, there's new guidance and, and regulations coming out of the EU, which, which could provide examples, even though that's for the money laundering purposes and applies to the PSC register. They provide some useful ways of tools through which, in this case, the keeper could help to make sure that the inf information on entry is correct and also that it continues to be correct as the register is ongoing. Uh, it's quite a long answer, but I, th I think at the, at the core of it, one of the questions I have really is, does that not therefore create a legal responsibility for the keeper? which is presently absent, whereas at the moment it's very clear that the legal responsibility is for the person submitting uh, the information. Uh, and isn't, that, isn't there a danger in, create, in moving the responsibility to the keeper, in particular in keeping it up to date, uh, which is formidably difficult. And I, I just make the observation, having worked for 30 years for a bank, it took us 10 years to work out how many customers we had. We knew how many accounts we had, but it took us 10 years to work out how many customers, precisely for the sort of reasons described. It may well do need to change the, the way in which the responsibilities of the keeper are described in this regulation, but I think it comes back to the, the fundamental question of what is this register for and how can we ensure it's fit for purpose? And without making some changes, Global Witness worries that, that the, re the register may end up with information which is really unhelpful. Well, just tiny, tiny point, given that Companies House does not verify the information that's given, and much of the ownership information will relate to a company, particularly in the areas where there is lack of clarity. Um, having this require clarity would not necessarily actually create the clarity that we desire if it's a company that owns where there is no verification of that. I saw John Sinclair dying to come in there. Kim Vina, um, okay. The point I was simply going to make was that the Law Society had suggested at the end of their, consult, of their response the idea of giving the keeper the ability to ask for information. At present, the keeper is um, a relatively passive party to this. I think we would be concerned if the keeper was made an active part of this in that the resourcing required to actively investigate particularly when you get into foreign entities, um, would not, uh, the key, I, it's hard to see the keeper ever having the resources to do that. And it's, it's therefore whether there is a intermediate step where rather than simply dealing with the information that is presented to the keeper, there is at least the possibility of the keeper choosing to make a request for information actively. Okay, Whether I'm going to move on um, to topic. Mark Ruskell, who has got a series of questions. Uh, thanks. Um, we've already touched briefly this morning on the issue of sanctions that should apply for non-compliance. And obviously, we've got two groupings there. We've got people who are or entities that are deliberately uh, not registering um, to, uh, you know, allow their anonymity. But there's also a situation where there are those who may inadvertently not register and, and not comply. So can we start with the, with the group that are uh, seeking anonymity? And the evidence we had from Global Witness Community Land Scotland, you suggested that the £5,000 fine would be insufficient to deter um, that grouping. Could, could you explain why that is? Do you have evidence of why that level of fine, in, in your view, would be insufficient? Or that level of sanction, either? It doesn't have to be a fine. 
think of people in Scotland and in, in echoing many of, of, of Global Witness's points in relation to, to, to the various aspects we've discussed today. Um, it, it's firmly of the view that there, there, there do need to be appropriate sanctions uh, in relation to encouraging and ensuring that those entities that should be um, making submissions and registering on, on the register actually do so. £5,000 as, as an upper ceiling in relation to acting as a, a, as a fiscal enforcement measure um, may not be, frankly, uh, terribly significant for, for some entities that may be seeking not to um, register in practice. And so on that basis, and I read with interest what was said in, when, when you had your session with uh, civil servants a few, few weeks ago in relation to what, what's available on the scale at the moment with regard to sanction and the fact that that would require amendment of, I think, the, the Land Reform Act 2016, if that were to be uh, increased. Uh, I think our view is that in, in, in the, the bigger picture, in the grander scheme of things, £5,000 is not necessarily uh, a, a particularly significant disincentive or incentive not to, to, to register. Sorry, let me rewind. £5,000 is not necessarily an incentive to register for some parties who may have an interest in not doing so for whatever reason. So really it's about uh, opening up the scope in relation to that. Um, but just to kind of follow on from that as well in relation to whether there should be sanctions available and whether there should be criminal sanctions, we would of the view certainly, I know it's not a view that's shared by everybody, of the view that that should be the case because it's an important uh, element in relation to ensuring that this register does what it is intended to do, frankly, which is increase transparency and enhance uh, that process with regard to, to these, these issues. Um, and, th and that being the case, uh, you know, it's, we would encourage that, that to be uh, retained in the regulations. Megan McKenna's wanted to come in. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I mean, for us, this is a really important part of the regulation. Our, our view that the £5,000 maximum wasn't based on sort of evidence on the ground. It was more that that, looking at how that compared to comparable fines in other pieces of regulation. The Land Register, the 2012 Act for the creation of, of the Land Registry is, um, so the Land Register, sorry, that has a, a statutory maximum, uh, the, the fines up to a statutory maximum, which is 10000 Likewise, the um, the PSC register has a has a has a higher ten thousand threshold fine. So we, we just thought that in compar in comparison to the fines introduced for again this this uh, non-compliance in terms of providing false or misleading information that that what was being proposed in this regulation wasn't in line with with comparable pieces of other relevant acts. The question though is <laughs> whether or not the solution to this if is 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 um, if changing the fine, the, the maximum fine requires changing the Act, the Land Reform Act itself, is that a route that can be gone down or could there be other ways in, in, in terms of creating other types of sanctions which could be applied, which, which could be applied to, as, a, as a deterrent against those who want to, who are not going to be voluntarily willing to, 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 to provide the right information to this register. Um, Sorry. What might those sanctions so, be? So, well, what, what we had suggested in our in our submission was that the completion of this um, RCI registration process be a precondition for undertaking other administrative and financial changes or transactions relating to the land. For example, when entering a title into the land register, um, mortgaging or remortgaging properties, or any other changes which are required to the to the title deeds. This is something which the um, explanatory notes to the draft regulations they mention it but they say that it's not it's not it wasn't something that they proposed in the regulation without giving any explanation why so we're not clear what the what the reasons that such preconditions weren't introduced in this but it's interesting that this the precondition of registering um in this in the scottish land register is actually a proposal for the uk the uk foreign entity the new um sorry, the draft registration of overseas entities bill, which is the new UK's proposal for this new register of foreign entities, will require proof of registering um, in this UK-wide um, register as a precondition for foreign entities to be able to um, make those kind of changes to their, their title in Scotland. So that there's, what the UK government is proposing is those preconditions. We can't see any reason why that couldn't be introduced into these regulations. 
if, or in addition to possibly, but if there is concern that opening up the 2016 Act in terms of changing the upper threshold of the fines is not, is not possible at this stage. Can I... Final question. Yeah, can I, can I just look at this from the other perspective, though? I mean, I think Mr Sinclair has already raised the issue of, you know, proportionality, and it's very different between a pension fund and a, and a you know, a, a small, you know, partnership or somebody trying to, you know, deal with an executory on, on a will or whatever. Um, uh, how should these regulations be, a, be applied um, proportionally to those who are innocently and inadvertently failing to comply? suggestion might be um, that there's almost like a two-stage process um, so that rather than by, by failure merely the offence is committed that um, uh, people who are quite um, innocently um, uh, failing when they should be um, should have the opportunity when it's brought to their attention uh, to rectify the position and, and to submit whatever information or, or, or changes that uh, they'd failed to do before the, the, the penalty kicks in. So they no longer have the excuse of ignorance and they're given a, a, a reasonable period of time um, within which to rectify that so that um, you know, they're not automatically criminalised um, through inadvertent failure, but 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 can then choose to become criminalised if they if they fail to to uh, 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 attend to mm -hmm. an actual explicit notification that they have something they should do. Mm -hmm. Apologies, we're going to have to move on to a final question from Alec Rowley. Convener, can I ask in terms of foreign entities who are beneficial owners of property across the UK, should they be included, excluded and why? I mean, I think from Global Witness's, Witness's perspective, yes, it's, um, we're in a tricky situation right now with the two pieces of regulation currently being consulted on this register here and the new register at the UK level. From our perspective, it's too early to say whether or not the Scottish regulations should exclude those entities because um, our understanding is that the, um, the UK regulations haven't yet defined exactly what type of foreign entities will be included in the UK register. It's a register which is managed by Companies House. So we're expecting it to be mainly corporate entities. It won't, for example, include trusts. So the UK, they, so Scotland's register um, should still include foreign trusts, but we, it's, it, it's, it's, not, it's, too early at this, it's too early to be able to say, take them all out. We need to wait and see what the UK is going to be doing and, and exactly what type of foreign entities will be covered by their regulation and new register before sort of knowing what to exclude and put into Schedule 2 for this register. John Scott's got a, a follow-up question to that. I'm just not certain if this question has been answered, but should professional advisers be explicitly excluded from Schedule 1 or not? Yes, no. Quick round the panel. Where they're only acting in their capacity as professional advisors or paid professional advisors and I think the, the difficulty is going to be whether you are both if you are a, a, you could be a, a solicitor acting for a company but also on the board an executor anyone else get any thoughts on that before Alec do you want to follow up okay uh, well no one's got any other questions to ask um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming along today and given evidence. Thank you very much for your very comprehensive evidence. I'm going to suspend this meeting for a couple of minutes while we allow the new witnesses to come in. Thank you.
Okay, the third item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence on a proposal by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 in relation to the following UK statutory instrument proposals. Ionising radiation, basic safety standards, miscellaneous provisions, Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2018 and the Justification Decision Powers of EU Exit Regulations 2018. We have been joined by Charles Stuart Roper from the Scottish Government and James Hamilton, Solicitor for the Environmental Branch of Rural Affairs Division. Welcome. Um, I'm going to go straight to questions for you on this, these issues uh, from John Scott. Thank you, convener. Good morning, gentlemen. And so, in the approach, the approach in the event of a no deal scenario, um, in the event that there is a deal, in a contrary way, including a transitional period, will there require to be changes to the provision in these regulations? And what will those changes be and how will they be achieved? Um, no, um, the, the, the changes won't come into, a for, into force until um, exit day, whenever that is. So um, if there is a transition period, all um, we'll have done is got these ready early, and then they will, the, the changes will still need to be made, but they won't come into force until the actual exit actually takes place. Excellent. Could the Scottish Government give more detail about which reserved and devolved responsibilities and or powers are relevant to the regulations? Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's two sets. For the, the first set, the um, ionising radiation basic safety standards miscellaneous provisions amendment, which are a very snappy titled set of regulations, um, is basically environmental protection um, under the um, basic safety standards directive. So it's um, protection of the public and the environment from um, radiation in the environment. And, um, the, the powers that are um, pertaining to us under those regulations are mainly about um, <coughs> the levels of acceptable contamination and um, the setting standards for clean-up and contamination. Um, so these are, these are powers that are both reserved and, and evolved. Obviously, they're reserved for Scotland in terms of um, the, the, the amount of radioactive substance legislation that's reserved in Scotland and our own contaminated land regulations. The, the, the instrument doesn't make any change to the balance of powers or indeed to the exercise of the powers. All it does is update the references so the regulations stay um, effective um, in the event of exit. Um, the justification regulations <coughs> are generally only exercised at a um, reserved level, um, but they, in principle, could be exercised at a developed level as well if somebody wanted to do something with radiation only in Scotland, in that unlikely um, um, eventuality. And the changes, again, don't make any change to the balance of reserved or devolved powers. Um, they merely update the, the way in which they can be exercised to make sure they're still exercisable after exit. Right. And finally, I want to ask you, are you, the Scottish Government, satisfied that the regulations will receive the appropriate level of scrutiny at Westminster? Yes, um, sorry. Yes, um, I am. I mean, fortunately, um, I mean, as you know, we're, we're first with one of these notifications to the committee, and my um, colleagues down south have been working hard to be um, ahead of the wave of measures being introduced at Westminster. So, yes, um, I think the, these ones will. They've had a, quite a lot of um, revision and checking already at um, official level um, across um, Whitehall, and we've, we've obviously checked them for our interests. Um, <clears throat> and given they are merely designed to maintain the current status quo of how these regulations work, I think there, there certainly will be sufficient um, um, interest to ensure that, that that's the case. Thank you. I wonder if you could just confirm my understanding that uh, there has been a special procedure introduced in a new committee at Westminster for these EU regulations, uh, which does mean that there will be at least that level of scrutiny of the detail uh, of this legislation and other similar European Union Withdrawal Act regulations. Yes. That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> uh, morning to you both. Um, I'd like to uh, just turn the focus on to SEPA's functions and if um, either of you could please answer um, for the committee. 
um, whether the functions of SEPA will be impacted by the introduction of the new regulations, and has this been discussed with SEPA? My understanding is SEPA's functions won't be impacted by this. Um, the SEPA's regulation of radioactive substances now under the Environmental Authorisation Regulations um, 2018, which has the effect that before they can authorise a, a practice involving ionising radiation, it has to be justified. So that will, that will continue. The, the, the justification regime will continue to sit alongside that with all the existing justified practices. So there will be no, no effect fr from that one. Um, the, the other instrument uh, deals with the parts of the Basic Safety Standards Directive, which I, uh, I don't think impact on SEPA. So, and I, again, it's all we're doing is seeking to maintain the status quo. There will be no impact on, on SEPA's regulatory activities or no change. A, a, a follow-up to that. Um, are there any implications for transportation of any of these materials? And if so, what the, those might be? I mean, transportation of radioactive substances is, is reserved. So um, I don't, I'm not aware of them having to do um, any changes to um, the transportation regulations, but that would be something that's being assessed by UK government colleagues to, to see if they, they need to make any changes to those. But no, transportation is, is a reserved matter. Right, thank you. And has the um, Scottish Government, are you aware that they've received any representations in relation to the regulations um, and the intention to consent to the UK ministers making regulations on behalf of the Scottish Government? Um, no, I, I don't think I don't think they have. Um, because the intention is so clearly just to maintain the regulatory systems as they currently are, there has been limited consultation of the on these. But that but that reflects the the, the fact that there is there is nothing really to consult on. We're we're merely acting with our UK colleagues to ensure that the current regulations, which work effectively but quite quietly in the background, can continue to work effectively in the future. Right, and uh, just lastly, from from um, my lines of questioning, um, are there are there any enforcement functions under the current regulations that require to be transferred to any Scottish or UK uh, bodies as a result of um, uh, of this process? And I think I know the answer, but I'd like it for the record. <laughs> In view of your previous answers, we'll just no. Um, there there are no functions that require right. to be transferred. The, there's no impact on the existing functions of Scottish regulators. Right, that's helpful. Thank you. Rascal. Just following on from that, um, can you just explain how the enforcement functions that exist at the moment in the Euratom Treaty under Article 106A, how those will be replicated with these regulations on, on exit? Sorry, could you ask me that again? Um, so the, the enforcement functions, how they'll be replicated uh, on exit for, for the EU. So the enforcement functions that are currently within the Euratom Treaty, how those will be replicated. On to that in writing, I'm afraid. Um, I, you? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, not, if, these are, if these are the enforcement functions of the... Um, in relation of the to treaty, environmental protection. ..of the yeah. treaty, the treaty um, function, then... Um, <clears throat> I mean, the... the, the, the the directly applicable law, which in, is in regulations, has to be will be either become UK law or Scottish law as relevant, and will be um, fixed for any deficiencies. Where we're talking about enforcement under the treaty, that we comply with the treaty. Obviously, once we once the UK leaves the treaty, yeah. we no longer have that degree of enforcement. There's a much wider discussion, as I'm sure you're aware, about how in the future we will provide for that sort of environmental law underpinning um, within the UK and within Scotland. And my colleagues are, are thinking about that in a, as a much wider issue in terms of the, the future assurance that environmental laws in general are, are, are up to scratch. The assurance that's currently, in a sense, given by our membership of the EU and Euratom, how that is provided for in future. And there's the ongoing discussions about how that, how that should be done in future. Right. So there isn't clarity at the moment about who carries forward all the aspects of the enforcement function, then. Is that, is that right? Does CEPA have a role? But Sorry. Um, so maybe I've confused. In terms of enforcement of the individual sets of regulations, that's right. entirely clear. Okay. It's CEPA for the Radioactive Substances Regulations in Scotland. It's the Office for Nuclear Regulation for Transport. There is no doubt about the enforcement of our domestic regulations. The only, the only point at which there becomes any... Um, 
the, the, there's still a discussion is that at the moment, of course, our regulations have to comply with the Euratom Treaty. Yeah. And, and in the same way that other environmental regulations have to comply with the relevant directives right. under um, the EU treaties. And there is still a discussion about that wider issue of about the assurance of environmental law in the future. Okay. But there is no doubt about the continued enforceability of all our domestic right. systems of regulation. So it's a wider question about who watches the watchers yeah, then, yes. effectively. And that's the bit which hasn't been that's decided on. That's the bit that's still under discussion, right. yes. Okay. Thank you. Richard Lowe. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. The ionising radiation basic safety standards miscellaneous provisions regulations 2018 as described as containing definitional references. Proposed regulations will be corrected by replacing definitions by reference to the directive with the text of the definitions. Which definitions in these regulations require to be changed and what will the definitions be once amended? The definition that requires to be changed is the definition of orphan source, which currently refers to the, the, the definition of orphan source in the Basic Safety Standard Directive, which itself relies on some other terms which are defined in the Basic Safety Standards Directive, which include licensing and authorisations. Those terms themselves rely on the definition of competent authority. So license or authorisation has to be granted by a competent authority, and a competent authority has to be in an EU member state. So that has the effect of undermining the definition of orphan source. So the new definition of orphan source is being added. Some other definitions are being added to support the definition of orphan source itself. The other impact is that instead of a reference to Article 102, we're introducing those principles um, in the annex to these regulations. And in order to support that annex, uh, sorry, that schedule, we've had to introduce or Bays have had to introduce two new definitions, which is definition of protective measures and a definition of remedial measures, which are equivalent to the definitions that currently exist in the Basic Safety Standards Directive. Uh, can you also explain, thanks for that, can you also <laughs> explain why the remainder of the definitions and the regulations will continue to be operable post-Brexit and where the 2018 regulations refer to lists of acceptable materials uh, can, in other words, is the intention to remove all references to directive and its supporting annexes. So, for example, if the directive is amended or superseded, the new regulations will come in delinked or will be completely delinked. The, the intention is not to remove all the references to the directive. So, Bayes will have carried out an exercise to identify reference to, references to the directive that will create deficiencies. So that would include things like references to things happening in, in member states, for example, where there's other references to the directive that don't create those sorts of deficiencies. I, the, the view can be taken that, that those references can still work effectively. With the regard to the, the question about going forward, the effect of the Withdrawal Act is to or, or the effect of references to directives in domestic legislation could either take effect at the date that those regulations come into force or in the case of ambulatory references, the effect of the Withdrawal Act is to freeze the ambulatory reference at, at the exit date. So changes to regulations after the exit date obviously won't be uh, referring to directives, but there's mechanisms in place to address those concerns. De depending on when that exit day is, um, is it the intention to transfer these uh, annexes fully into UK law or, or Scottish law? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure there's a straightforward answer to that question. There's various places in, in domestic law where we already refer to the annexes um, f for those requirements. Although, so they to that extent, they already form a part of, of domestic law. The, the change that will happen at exit date is that these, these sorts of changes to address these deficiencies will take effect to make sure that, so for example, the, the example of orphan source that I gave to ensure that that doesn't become an efficient, uh, a deficiency and that reference will continue to work effectively after exit day. So there will still be some references afterwards. We are looking to fix the, the issues to make sure that they still work effectively with effect from exit day. Thank you. Thank you. Finley Carson. Thank you. Um, my question refers to the justification of practices involving ionising 
Ionising uh, Radiation Regulations 2004, which draws upon the European Communities Act 1972, uh, which gives the UK and Scottish ministers the powers to make specific regulations. Can I ask, uh, what's the process under the, the 2004 regulations for approval of practices involving uh, the ionising radiation? What are the, what's the current Scottish minister's role in that, and how will that process change following the, the amendments? Um, well, what the situation is, in addition to the, um, the regulations, there's a memorandum of understanding between the administrations, which define the, the way um, consultation works under the regulations. So there is a, there's a very um, full and close consultation on any proposal that comes forward to ensure um, that where, where something's being agreed um, at a UK level, the, other, the devolved administrations are, are fully involved in that decision. So that, that carries forward the memorandum and the whole system carries forward as it currently functions and it currently functions very satisfactorily. In fact, these decisions are quite rare and all, um, the recent examples have been about um, technologies, um, reactor um, technologies for a generation plant. Um, it's in fact quite, um, these decisions don't come up very often, but there is this full um, administrative process in place in support of the regulations to ensure that before any regulation is made by UK ministers, these are very thorough consultation involvement of, of ourselves and the other devolved administrations. Can, can you give us an idea of the scope of the new powers uh, which will replace the, the 1972 Act? And will, will it have any limitations? The, the new power is essentially equivalent to the existing power. It's limited in its scope by the justification regulations 2004, essentially to document a decision of the justifying authority that, that a practice is to be justified. The, the most recent draft of the, the statutory instrument that we've seen does include some limitations on that, and that, that's essentially to make it clear that that power uh, can only only be used for the purposes of making a justification decision. So, so the scope is exactly the same. Okay, so you, you maybe answer the next question, which is what parliamentary procedures uh, will be exercised in the UK and, and the, the Scottish Government? I would have to double check that. Scottish I'm, Parliament, I should say. So. I'm almost sure it's, it's the, the negative procedure, but I, I, I would have to double check that. I, okay. I don't want to mislead you. Okay. Um, I've got a question about the post Brexit situation that. Um, has the Scottish Government considered that there's the possibility of standards diverging from those under the directive? Like, for example, if new evidence becomes available, and how might the UK and, and, and Scottish Government benefit or participate in Euratom research past that point? OK, to take the first question um, first about what if, um, I think you're asking essentially if standards evolve at the EU level, well, the Euratom level, will we follow? Generally, um, standards, international standards of um, radiological protection are set at the higher level of the um, IAEA, the UN body, and are then reflected in EU, um, direct, in EU directives. So the intention, um, of both of ourselves and the UK government, is to keep an eye on developments at that IEA level and move um, with um, changes to the international standards, um, at least as fast as um, the EU does. So um, they shouldn't, over time, um, open up a divergence of standards between ourselves and the Euratom structures, because we're both, we, you know, the intention is that in this both uh, makes it world, we'll both be following the lead of the IEA. Um, on the, on the question of future participation in research, um, the UK government's white paper did say that they want to seek a very close working relationship in the future with the Euratom, including on research. But that's obviously, you know, a matter of negotiation, which, you know, like all the negotiations, is waiting for its place in the, in the importance of negotiations. But there is a very clear intention, the UK government, to try and negotiate uh, um, a continued involvement in the research activities of Euratom. OK. Mark Ruskell? Follow up to that. Does the IEAA have any uh, kind of governance function for, for states at all? I mean, is there is there a sort of because we, we discussed earlier on about enforcement and a kind of wider governance? Yeah, there is a, just, it's a it's a looser. There's a, there's a reporting um, obligation, so mm -hmm. we report our, our national program for radioactive waste, 
and uh, as a UK level, but our, our, our participation in that with consulted and discussion policies and practice feed into that. And they do um, regulatory reviews periodically. Um, and there's one indeed due quite um, in the next year where they send, well, they, they, experts from other IEA countries are recruited to come as a team to come and test our regulatory systems um, for effectiveness. So there is that review from the IEA, which is, a, is an external review. It doesn't quite have the teeth of an EU your atom because you don't have the infraction risk. So, but, but I can't think, see any, um, I, it's hard to conceive of a situation where we and indeed the UK government wouldn't respond to a recommendation of an IEA review. So it, it, it fulfills many, some of those roles of external, many of the roles of external check on, on our practices and the quality of our regulatory systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, has the Scottish Government had discussions with the UK Government as to whether they intend to ensure that the principles of the Basic Safety Standards Directive are brought into UK law? Um, well, I mean, the, the, the fact is that the, the, I mean, the existing regulations reflect um, BSSD standards, and indeed the, um, the, the, the recent transposition, transposition <coughs> exercise ensured that um, UK regulations were all up to date with the more recent um, BSSD. And once it's into UK law, there's no intention. To, there's no intention of the UK government to immediately change that law. So, um, so yes, the, their, their, their stated intention is to to maintain those standards as they already are. So I think we um, and I, um, there's certainly we have no indication that they they wish to diverge from that. So that means that. In it's essentially the same standard. The BSSD standards will roll forward in, in UK, UK law, in, in, and they're already in UK law, and they won't be. There's no reason they won't be taken. The, the, what we're doing, what the UK government doing, is fixing our law to make sure that they're still effective once we exit. So to fix references and to make sure that our regulations work as freestanding regulations, but still with the same standards as as they are in the BSSD carrying forward. Okay, thank you, Angus Macdonald. Um, can we just, uh, sticking with the BSSD, um, has, has the government identified a, a package of measures required to address deficiencies in legal instruments transposing the BSSD? And, and can we expect to see more notifications in this package? Uh, and if so, any information uh, that you can provide uh, on that would be helpful, for example, about the scope and timescales. I, I don't anticipate any more notifications of UK um, deficiencies, in, including devolved competences in this area of um, radio, radio substances regulation. I think this is this is it. This is what's been identified. Um, the, we may need to make a, f a few changes to deficiencies in our radioactive contaminated land regulations um, which, of our own. Um, which we will do, be doing, the plan is on that longer time scale through what we still anticipate as a transition period, but they will likely come forward in a, in a wider um, wrap-up instrument um, fixing mine deficiencies across a range of regulations rather than as a freestanding instrument. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If no other members have got any questions, um, I want to thank you for coming along and answering all our questions today. Um, next meeting on the 2nd of October, the committee will hear from evidence from the Keeper of the Register of Scotland on the regulations to establish a register of persons holding a controlled interest in land. And we'll also consider our work programme and a report on the 2019-2020 budget. And as agreed earlier, the committee will now move into private session and I request that the public gallery be cleared as the meeting is now closed. Thank you.